That's what we're doing too, working from home. Of course, Brian's in his office. Yeah, yeah. Not I used to work from home, and it, it's an in, it's not quite as nice as everybody makes it out to be. Is my general conclusion that? Uh, yeah, I agree. It's yeah. got its it's definitely got its pros and cons. No doubt about yep. it. Yep. Yep. Well, Stephen, I'm glad to have you on today. I appreciate you taking the time to join us. I'm very pleased, uh, yeah, and I'm extremely pleased that uh, that you're interested. And I'll try and uh, I'll try and be funny, but sometimes I'm not as funny as I think I am. I just have to get through that. <laughs> okay. Oh, we're gonna have plenty of fun. This is fine. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's get this started. I'm ready. You ready, Brian? Heck yeah. All right. Here we go, Leadheads. Uh, the episode that you've been waiting for, we've been promising you for a while. We have Pulitzer Prize winner, New York Times bestselling author, uh, one of my top t- 10, probably 10, 15 favorite movies based off his book, Stephen Hunter joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Stephen, welcome in. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. Also joining me uh, this episode, to for such an epic guest, I had to have help. So uh, I recruited the best, Brian Keeney, uh, our sponsor of the AK Corner, joining us. Brian, welcome in. Great to be here and great to be talking to one of my favorite authors, um, an author who actually knows something about guns. It's Reading his books is, a, is you learn something as well as being entertained. So, real honor to be on the show with you, sir. Thank you, Brian. As Brian said, you've got uh, pretty pretty good knowledge of firearms, better than than most authors. You've you've got a lifetime of, of gun history and experience behind you. And we're going to talk about that as we get in, into the show. Uh, but before we get into that, we'll make sure you guys go back to last episode if you didn't have an opportunity. We had the author Andrew Cousins. I don't know if you're familiar with Andrew or not, Stephen, but Andrew's a new up-and-coming writer. Uh, He's a former OGA agent, did some time. I guess he's done some time with the CIA, and he wrote a book called A Failed State, and we talked to Andrew uh, about his book and then his company Forward Movement Training, uh, where they do all sorts of firearms training there for civilians, individuals, and of course he does law enforcement military training as well. They've got a very cool simulator program there that we talked about as well. So make sure you go back, check that episode out. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good, good, good dude. If you haven't met Andrew, I think you guys would hit it off. Um, he, he's a pretty cool dude. Uh, we've also had, uh, another one of probably your colleagues and I think you know him, Jack Carr. Jack is a great guy. Yeah, Jack's been on a couple of times. I let him know that you were going to be on this episode, and uh, he was excited. So um, Jack Jack will be listening in on this one. Uh, I don't want to give any spoilers on the on the new book. We want to talk about Targeted, your new book, which – has it been released yet, or is it going to be it's next week? The actual publication date is January 18th. That's the drop date. And in the book business, they still have – it's still like the movies in that they have a premiere day and it's not a lot. They're not, the booksellers aren't allowed to put it on the shelf until that day. And depending on when this airs, uh, folks can either go to their bookstore or wait two or three days uh, until, or they can, can always order, as you know, from Amazon or any of the big mail order places. Right. Yeah. You can get anything on Amazon. Definitely. And they can pre-order it on Amazon, too. I think it's available for pre-order. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so you guys can go ahead. This is the the 12th uh, book in the Bob Lee Swagger series that you've written, Targeted. And it, it kind of picks up, picks up from, from the previous book that you had. I'm going to let you talk about it because I don't want to give spoilers. So I think you're probably the best person to talk about it without uh, spoiling anything. But I've got like all kinds of questions I want to ask about it, so we may have to save that for another episode so I don't ruin it. 
Well, that's fine. I hope I don't give away any spoilers. <laughs> As you say, it's tricky in that there's a lot of information that uh, if you know it's coming, it's its impact is somewhat lessened. So yeah. uh, I'm going to tiptoe around some stuff. Okay, uh, that's okay. fair. The that's- book is about Bob Lee finds himself 75. All he wants to do, and it's all I want to do. It's all any 75 year old man wants to do is sit on the front porch and rock that's what's wrong with that seems fine to me damn thing wrong with that but uh, it's not to be he is outed that as he's identified by a newspaper and suddenly he's famous he doesn't like being famous puts all kinds of pressures and annoyances on him but on top of that he's then subpoenaed by a house committee on uh, security, and it turns out that these folks want to use him as a kind of a fulcrum for a larger agenda, which has to do with use of force and with uh, uh, some of the cutting edge social issues that we're now facing in this country. As it appears that violence in certain sectors is uh, uh, much, much on the rise, and we all wonder what can be done and what we can do about it uh and these people are full of ideas they know exactly what has to be done uh they're good-hearted people but they're also in their political way rather ruthless and it's easy to be ruthless when you live in an ivory tower and it's also yeah. easy to be ruthless when you've got men with guns protecting you uh and Suddenly, they find themselves in a hellishly violent, potentially murderous situation where there are no men with guns and all the glass of the glass tower is broken. And although they have felt some contempt for working class Bob, the the sniper, the killer, all of a sudden, surprise, he's their best friend. (laughs) <laughs> oh, how much they love Bob when the lead is flying and the chips are down. And that's basically the story of the book, how he's in this situation where uh, to, he has a, he feels the armed man, the armed righteous man's obligation to defend not just himself, but larger issues. And at the age of 75, you say, what can he do, especially when he's, handcuffed to a wheelchair and spoiler <laughs> i <still> agree <laughs> that he does pretty well for a 75 year old guy in a wheelchair and that's one of the i hope it's the pleasure of the book is watching him operate under those circumstances with those issues on the table yeah i and i think that that's a really good recap of the book without actually uh giving uh, giving away anything but um I really, I really like the way that you, again, that you tied in with today's issues that we're having with the, uh, the gun control, the people that we're dealing with that are trying to force and push the gun, gun control on us. I think some of the characters uh, in this novel will be readily recognizable to the readers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think you can you label them real. Here? Real Love quick, you, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the book. Um, it was, it was probably one of the, the quickest reads that I've ever done as far as a novel goes because I was just like really like wanted to get to the next chapter and, and find out what was going on and what was happening. The build up was uh fabulous the way that you started the book off. Um, we actually talked about it in one of the episodes earlier without giving anything away. I do this segment, Stephen, it's called the Talking That AK Corner, and we talk nothing but AK-47s on that um, segment of the show. And, of course, you know, without giving anything away, that kind of ties into your book. So <laughs> It does, indeed. And uh, I own a few AKs, and uh, they're great fun to shoot. And as you know, they're very practical. In fact, from where I'm sitting, there is a 74, not seven feet away, with a nice 
28 rounds in its 38 in its 30 round magazine because you don't want to overtax the spring. And, Smart uh, man. Yes, it's not packed, but it is loaded, and the safety is odd. So I've got two gross movements press down that big fat grand safety, and then pull back and release the bull, and then uh, and then we're ready. Whatever happens, good, bad, or nothing. At least we're ready. At least we don't have to, you know, end up screaming for help. Absolutely, you know, yeah. Take care of ourselves, which is what uh, Sergeant Kalista caught, guaranteed us uh, 70 years ago in the turret of his T-34 at the Battle of Kursk. <laughs> Very nice. We might have to get you on the AK corner. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, I'm not an expert. I do a lot of shooting. But, uh, you know, there are intricacies and nuances of the mechanics of the firearm that I have to acknowledge I don't really – I can't really stay with. I don't have that kind of a mechanical mind. I can clean, maintain, and actually shoot pretty well, but I will never rebuild a gun or do anything uh, remarkable to a gun. I'll just shoot it. You there know? you go. <laughs> you do what they were intended to be done. You just shoot them. Exactly. That's why we have people like Brian in our lives that build them and repair them and uh, modify them for us. Yeah, we actually, you're a man after my heart, sir. Uh, yeah, we make a, uh, a U.S. made AK-47 that has some modernizations that I think would have happened on their own in Russia were it not for communism. And when you look at the growth of the M16 and early AR-15s into what they've become today, we try to do that for the AK with um, sub-2 MOA accuracy, high uh, reliability, much lighter weight. This is one of my guns here that Lefty's holding up, and it looks mostly like an AR on the outside. It has a Picatinny rear trunnion, so you can use stand, you know, all the hot swappable stocks that are available these days. Right. Um, but uh, under the hood, it's still an AK. And yeah, uh, I love them for exactly the reasons you highlighted of simplicity, reliability, durability, and overall lethality. It's a, a pretty sweet spot for uh, um, for the everyday. And I'm holding uh, one up here. This this is a one of Brian's, it's ODS 1775, for our well, video watching crowd. It's no longer probably true, but there was a time in my life when I thought that we were having troubles with the AR-15, or as the M4, as it's militarily called. And I thought the best solution to that is just take a couple of billion dollars and buy four million AKs from the Soviet. <laughs> Hello, no more problems. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. I mean, exactly. Don't sell them to anybody. I'm sure they would have sold them to us. Oh, oh without yeah, a doubt. Yeah, the... The, U the U.S. government for many years has been the largest worldwide purchaser of AKs. They oh, just really? sold them. Yes. Yeah, under the average consumption under Hillary Clinton's State Department was around 200000 a year that they would wow. buy up from one location and then sprinkle the quote-unquote freedom fighters around the Middle East. Oh, and uh, interesting. that interesting? Yeah. So we do buy a lot of them. I wish we would use them domestically, but... Oh well. Yeah, we buy them, but they never end up here. Yeah, yeah. And then they ban they ban the importation of them, so we can't get yep. them back. <laughs> well, and luckily, there's a bunch of larger outfits in the U.S. like Kalashnikov USA and Palmetto State that are making steel cased ammo and steel forged components in the U.S. So I think American industry is going to pick up right when we need it to, which is the best outcome anyway. Yeah, I, I uh, that was initially a blow, and I kept waiting. Uh, I actually had invested in several dozen, well, not that many, but five or six uh, big cartons of uh, big crates of 5.45. Uh, I thought I'd make a fortune, but it didn't really <laughs> happen. So if you guys want to buy some, I'm your guy. Yeah, but it doesn't nice. hurt. To, it doesn't hurt I'm to have so extra. Happy. You have to come and pick it up. I can't. <laughs> I can't carry it up the stairs anymore. <laughs> well, we'd be happy like to take plan. some of that off your hands, no doubt. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of people yeah. would. Uh, and you can get in touch with Stephen at 
No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, targeted coming out um, as as our listeners are listening to this, I'm sure it's going to be available. So you can go to Amazon. You can go to. Uh, have you got a website? I don't think you even have a website. Do you? Uh, not really. No, I, there might be a Simon and Schuster website. Uh, I always uh, look at it to see what I've said recently. <laughs> what they say I've said. There is a, I do have a Facebook page, uh, Steve Hunter uh, Facebook. Uh, it turns out there's about 50 Steve Hunters, uh, or about 500 Steve Hunters in America. But if you keep working at it, you'll eventually, there it is, you'll eventually get to, you'll eventually get to, uh, you'll eventually find something with my name and face on it. So, And I believe if you go to at Stephen Hunter author, That'll be the one, Leadheads, uh, for his Facebook page. Is is this yeah, the right one? I don't right, but I don't even know. This one doesn't look it's right? Hard it's hard enough writing the damn things without <laughs> figuring out the web stuff. <laughs> well, that actually might be a, a great segue. As I was researching your, your life, um, I came across Esther Newberg as your first literary agent, which... I don't know too much about the literary word, world, but she's kind of a, a giant of, of that field. Would you mind telling us a little bit about how you got started? Uh, well, actually, Esther was not my first agent. She was my second agent. Uh, in the story of how I got her, she was, she was a, uh, what's called a top-tier agent. That is to say, a top-of-the-list agent, which meant that she generally, her clients were generally best sellers. And I wasn't in that uh, category then, but I'd had a dispute over a book, Dirty White Boys, with the agent uh, that I had. So it was time to part company. And fortunately, that agent fired herself. Uh -huh. So I didn't have to fire her because I don't think I would be very good at firing people. And if I get through my life without ever having to fire someone, I will consider it, I will consider it a part. Well, at any rate, so I'm looking for a new agent, and Esther is the big name in New York, then is now, and I sent her a letter and a copy of the book Point of Impact, which became Shooter, and I told her I had a new book, and I was seeking representation, I wondered if she'd been uh, be interested, and her answer was to throw it away. So <laughs> taking it to the trash, my letter falls out of the book. Shows <laughs> <laughs> how whimsical it could be. And she and it falls open. If it had fallen and closed, I don't know where I'd be. But it fell open, and she started reading it, and she liked it, and she called me. And we've, uh, she's been representing me ever since. That was her first book that she represented was Dirty White Boys, which she got. And uh, she sold it to David Rosenthal at, uh, at uh, Random House. And that sort of began phase two of my career as a, you know, I guess I would call myself a first tier author. Uh, Jack Carr has done a lot better. Mark Graney has done a lot better. Uh, Michael Connolly has done a lot better. But I've educated both my kids through graduate school, and I have. Uh, there's probably going to be enough money to educate my grandchildren when I pass. Nice. And uh, that's my does. Plus, I can buy any gun I want. That's success <laughs> to me. Heck you know, yeah. I don't need homes in Florida. I just need a safe full of guns and educated uh, children. What more do you want? <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. And and your your day job for for forever here has been as a and I guess you're retired from it now, but you were a uh, critic for quite a while. Movie critic. Um, I was a professional film critic for 28 years. Uh, uh, 16 and 27 years, 16 at the Baltimore Sun, and then the last 11 at the Washington Post. And if you ask me about it, I could probably remember one or two things about it. But uh, as a normal happening, it's pretty much of a blur. You know, all the movies have sort of 
merged into one movies yeah. and all the hundreds, the thousands of pieces I wrote that seemed so important have merged in my memory into one piece. Uh, it was a great way to live in those days. Newsrooms were the most fun you could have. Uh, I think newsrooms have changed. Uh, they've gotten different. Well, one thing they've gotten much younger and no one, under the age of 40 could fit into a newsroom anymore with some exceptions uh, but it's it's generally a very young person's business now and everybody who works for a newspaper i got to do one job everybody who works for a newspaper now does seven jobs mm. uh, and they haven't been trained for any of them and that sort of explains what's going on in newspapers today I want to ask you, you know, you, you bring up newspapers and, uh, you know, I'm old enough to, to have grown up with, you know, print media as being a main source of, of news, information, entertainment. Uh, but with, you know, the new generation, the print media is, is dying out. What's your, what's your take on that? Do you think that? Well, it, I, I think it's inevitable, but it was very sad. Uh, I was right in the forefront of watching that happen. And I remember for years on the post, we fought the idea uh, the, 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 the tech people came in and it soon became obvious that what they saw as uh, there was a conceptual difference, but what they saw and what we saw, what we saw was online being an online version of the newspaper and a recording, a photograph, if you will, of every newspaper page. And what they saw was what they call platform neutral, meaning it doesn't, it's not a, it's not a version of the newspaper, but it's something drawn in some degree, but not all degrees from the actual physical newspaper, but it's also an independent living organism that, uh, you know, fills a lot of the needs of the younger generation that you can be interactive with, that you can have, uh, you can leave uh, emails commenting on the, uh, on what you've read in the newspaper. And that was a big shock for a lot of us. No matter what you wrote, you got no more than two or three letters. Suddenly, we went online, and no matter what you wrote, you got no more than two or three hundred emails because it was so much easier to email. Yeah. And then the older reporters were uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, they were nonplussed. They were disturbed. They found that very difficult to get used to, and they didn't like being criticized vigorously and in some places viciously it was mm. just something they suddenly they'd been comfortable doing what they were doing and suddenly people are telling them in the hundreds that they suck <laughs> they yeah. didn't like that and that plus the fact that the newspapers were losing money and wanted to get rid of wanted to get rid of the higher place talent uh, and replace it with lower, younger, lower cost talent that bumped a lot of older, more stable, more conservative, more objective people out of the newspaper business. And that's why I think you saw this huge sea change starting probably around the two tens mm. uh, in the the sort of the the culture of the newspaper and why the newspaper became so much more ideological and so much no longer it no longer prized long deep reporting it it it, it was all about pieces that would get clicks mm -hmm. and the more clicks the better and there were times when it would circulate words uh, and you were instructed. <laughs> to put these words in the lead or the first or second or third graph of your story, because these were clickbait words yeah. It had nothing to do with the news or the story. It had to do with getting clicks. And a lot of the older people just found that very difficult to do. And suddenly many of them were asked to begin taking video 
and they became not only newspaper writers but videographers and that would go on the website and it just became almost overnight a different animal and as i say a lot of the older folks and i would not uh exclude myself from that group found it difficult found it hard to 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 make that adjustment the irony is that it also happened about 30 years previous when newspapers went from hot metal to uh uh computers or mm -hmm. to you know to to uh computerized papers and uh, a whole generation of older people was just literally cut off at the at the knees i mean these were really experienced journalists who'd yeah. done all and seen all and were expert at putting out a good fast tough hot metal newspaper and suddenly that experience was worthless and they were left struggling with something new and many of them conceptually never really got it and the only way they could get through it was memorize the computer commands by rote you know they had no idea what the computer commands meant they just knew that under certain circumstances they would put in these eight symbols and numbers of monkey gibberish <laughs> you know that's what their lives became trying to keep the monkey gibberish straight mm -hmm. and i was watching that happen again inevitable but again very sad i mean i saw a lot of very talented very experienced people just pushed out of the business and that's a great observation too and i like the analogy that you did by going back 30 year, years ago to the to the hot metal uh print to the computer digital age to to where we are today with the 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 instant you know gratification news information and but during that hot press um era change you probably didn't see a drop in the integrity of the news as much as you've what? seen today would you agree Yes, I would agree. And the reason is that that older generation was committed to the idea of a newspaper as being objective, neither left nor right. And somehow that got lost. Uh, and now Boy, did it. Yeah. many feel that they're telling the truth when they're giving you only one side of the story. And that I, I think that's had... Uh, that's one of the reasons why the media is no longer trusted, why uh, media people are among the lowest respected professionals uh, in, in you know, the United States. You yeah. uh, trust your car salesman more than your local anchor person. And again, and you're not wrong. Um, you're you're absolutely you're right. Model now. They understand that there is enough that the that we're so divided that there is enough money to sustain a paper of either hard left or in some few cases, hard right uh, ideology and that they don't need that. They don't need that middle anymore because there really isn't much of a middle. There's, there's where there used to be a middle. Uh, there's just, you know, there's a gulf. And there are people of the hard right and there are people of the hard left. And they're going to go, since going is easy, they're going to go where their heart and their minds take them on the Internet. Whereas the, 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 the newspaper itself was cumbersome in that you had subscriptions, you had traditions. And that's so odd. People used to get no matter what the newspaper said, it was almost a piece of furniture in their homes and they knew where everything was and they knew all the personalities and they knew all the bylines and it was a real part of the community. And now, uh, you know, the fact is my wife sitting behind me uh, proves uh, and there's not even a newsroom anymore. Everybody is in their own home. And there's no newsroom culture 
and there's very little newsroom culture and there's no com- uh, camaraderie. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no very few parties. Nobody gets, goes drinking after work. The whole uh, culture of the newspaper has changed and it's, uh, it's just a, it's a different thing now. I, and I'm glad, for one, that I'm not a part of it. I, I wouldn't have belonged in that world. Hmm. I, I, what, what you're saying is a dominant narrative um, makes a great deal of sense. Uh, so what I'm about to say isn't contradicting you, but I have a, a question that I've been pondering, and that's on fake news that we, and I think there is a, a rise with the driving factors that you describe here, that you've just described, um, where where integrity has kind of kind of gone out the window, but at the same time, um, there's a bunch of stories about how Adams and um, Jefferson hired newspaper writers to smear the other. They had this sort of fake news campaign um, two three hundred years ago, and uh, you know we have so much more. There's there's a much higher quantity of information available now, and it certainly moves at a much greater speed. But if you think of the idea of signal to noise, you know, on a radio, that would be how clearly you can hear somebody's voice over the static. I wonder if the general signal to noise of news is about the same. That is to say, there's a whole lot more fake news now, but there's also a whole lot more information and ability to go to Twitter and look at, you know, first basically most reporters, as I understand it, go to Twitter now and look at video feeds and then write a story about it. Um, Do you think that we're less well-informed now than ever, or do you think it's about the same? Uh, Well, I I thought you made two very good points in that uh, question. The first point was that what is happening now is not unprecedented, and particularly the press before the Civil War was very, very bitterly partisan, and papers were uh, committed to one side of, you know, any number of issues, the slavery issue, the Indian issue, the westward expansion issue, uh, and they were, uh, the politics were extremely uh, vitriol, uh, I'm looking for the adjective form, vitriolistic or vitriol, they were full of vitriol. Uh, So this is not, it's not like, this kind of anger is new. The second thing, the second point is, is about the more information being available. And I think the answer to that question is yes, absolutely. And what that means is instead of what people do these days is they, instead of having a single sort of Mandarin boss newspaper that they turn to is they, edit their, they assemble, they curate their own newspaper in their head. So they might go here for news from the left, and then they go there for news from the right, and then they go somewhere else for cultural news, and they have a favorite movie critic, so they go to him, and what they do is they put together sort of the ideal newspaper in their brain, and it's and that they, they have that freedom. That's what the internet ha- gives them is the freedom to do that. And that I am not so sure is such a bad idea. I actually like that's a rather democratic idea, and it's it's something that should be uh, encouraged and not uh, 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 discouraged. And that's why I find censorship by big tech, I mean, they should not be in the business of telling us who to read. They should be in the business of letting us read who we want to read. And, and that I find much more disturbing than anything that's going on on any individual newspaper or any particular place. I mean, and those people, and they're not journalists, and they don't understand the uh, they don't understand that the point of journalism was to let the reader weigh the arguments against one against the other and then come to his own conclusion. They think that the point of journalism 
is to uh, only allow one argument and that way get more people. Mm. And in my mind, that is a disaster uh, for the for the republic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the only thing we can do about it is talk about it. Talk about it everywhere. Talk, talk, talk. And just make sure that, you know, get these ideas of the democracy and media out and get people talking about them and hopefully believing in them. That's that's what I would say from my easy chair at age <laughs> 75 with two steel joints and a... Uh, and a uh, a chronic fatigue problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you uh, from your writing anyway, and what you just said, you give uh, the American populace a great deal of credit for being able to think, and that is a a charity that is not given by most these days. One one place where it was particularly striking is in your books. You use a lot of big words, and I happen to love to collect big words. And so I, I think that's just like ice cream. But a, a lot of writing has gotten, as far as I can tell, more and more dumbed down as time goes on. And I'm wondering if your diction, these choice of, of somewhat nuanced and complicated words, is conscious on your point. Are you are you seeking to have your, your readers learn a little bit about English, or is it just a natural, just how you write and you don't think much about it? Uh, well, it's kind of interesting. Um, it's a very, again, it's a very perceptive question. And the answer is something along these lines. It's that when I started, I had two entirely different voices between the way I wrote fiction and the way I wrote criticism. And film criticism in particular had a certain voice that was always ironic, was always sardonic, it was always, uh, it was always uh, satirical, it was always, it, it attempted to be witty, uh, and, you know, and you had a voice that was, in which a person tried to make his personality a part of the writing style. When I wrote fiction, I wanted it to be very dry and precise and un and, and just let the action and the characters tell the story. Uh, however, uh, as I got older and for good or for worse, it seemed to me that those two voices uh long about I, I can't even sometime after the turn of the century but maybe before 2010 maybe it happened started happening at the post it seemed to me that those two voices kind of merged and that the fiction writing is now in in many respects it reflects the tone not of the earlier books but of the uh, of the film criticism, and it's full of wisecracks. It's full of irony. It's like, for example, the first chapter of um, of uh, gee, what's the book? Oh, it's called Target. Targeted. The <laughs> chapter of that book is done in a fanciful, uh, exaggerated comic version of New Jersey, and I talk about three foot long albino uh grasshoppers and uh and marsh species of vegetation unknown to the planet earth and i create this sort of comic image of the grotesque new jersey and i would never have done that recently or until until you know the, the past five years but i had so much fun doing it and I do really deeply love New Jersey. <laughs> you know, sue me, okay? Kill me. I don't know. I, I'm not a – I did basic training in New Jersey in the winter, so you can understand why I'm not a fan of not New Jersey. Not too fond of New Jersey, yeah, definitely. And, and, and so the, the point is that the two voices have kind of merged into one meta voice, if you will, mm -hmm. and – I, it's not something that happened that I willed it to happen. 
and I think the the the, the choice of uh, vocabulary that Brian mentions is one function of that. Mm. And I I can't really say that it was a conscious plan. That's just when you write, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of words over. Uh, you know, I've been writing these damn books for 42 years now, and I've been doing film criticism for, I did film criticism for 26 years, and, and you know, it just gets all mulched together. Sure, <laughs> sure. So everything progresses towards oblivion, and this is a lot <laughs> things for more oblivion. You know, this this total mulch of of stuff. That's so that seems to be what's going on. Yeah, and I was gonna say something along those lines with your movie criticisms. The way that you write those versus the way that you write your books are completely different. Uh, if somebody goes and reads, you know, the the wording in your criticisms. They're, they seem to be like you were saying. They're they're a lot more colorful. They're a lot more. The the words that you're using are even more intellectual, I guess, uh, in your criticisms uh, of the movies. Let's talk about that because that's growing up. That was that's what you said that you wanted to do. That I've read. Now I wanted to get it from you. Uh, at an early age, you knew exactly what it was that you wanted to do, and you wanted to be a movie critic. Talk about that. Well, that's uh, I have said that, and uh, I believe it's true. Uh, I'm one of these strange people who got exactly what he wanted. And when I was 14, I knew that I wanted to be a film critic on a major newspaper. And I knew that I wanted to write uh, ironic, gun-centered thrillers. Uh, and both of those things happened. And, uh, and I find that very pleasing and if you ask me how you did it, uh, I would have no idea. <laughs> and I just, a lot of it may have been luck. I, I mean, there's no, we never talk about this, but so much depends on being there then when. And, uh, you know, if Maria Guanichelli had not come to New to Baltimore from New York and invited me to lunch in 1977. This whole thing, you know, I might be a retired copy reader, bitter over all my, how all the good stuff I thought was going to happen never happened. But she came, and she was interested in me. And she asked to see a book, and she was an editor, and so we got on that train. And I was able to publish a couple of books and the books helped me in the newspaper because on that newspaper at that time nobody was doing anything and the paper was in kind of the doldrums and all of a sudden this book review editor on the least important part of the newspaper the sunday edition is publishing books in new york city with famous publishers and that got me a lot of attention and so it well it, what it did was it validated me in a certain way and so the two fed off each other the books helped my movie helped me become a movie critic and being a movie critic did that help the books i don't know i i, I don't know it somehow did it, it it did. I mean, it sort of it sort of all worked together. And what I used to always say is that the two separate jobs gave me the two separate pleasures of writing. And the first pleasure was hot and dirty. You're done today. Forget about it. It's gone. Start again with a fresh slate tomorrow. And the other pleasure is you try and get it perfect over the long term, and that would be a novel. And uh, Lord knows I've never come close to perfection, but you're able to take your time to do your research, to reconsider, to reach, to change sequence, to change vocabulary, to change rhythm. Uh, I will sell the book that sort of put me in the big time was Point of Impact, and very late in that book, it was not working. It was in. I was in draft five, and it was not working. And at the 
very end, I had an idea that made it work. And that idea was I took the one character who was a disaster and I split him into two characters. And the two characters were the military guy, Ray Shrek, and the CIA guy, Hugh Meacham. And those two guys had been one character and he was too broad. You know what I'm saying? He had yep. the military officer's practicality and get it done, but he also had the CIA agents, agents, uh, CIA agents' sense of nuance and uh, and long game planning and uh, micro adjustments for a macro result. And when I split those into two, suddenly that book got really interesting. And uh, I have to say, uh, I had a wonderful editor at the time it, it, named, it Bannon named Ann Harris and she gave me a list of 14 ideas for the book and guess how many of them I used zero <laughs> however in thinking about those 14 I came up with the 15th idea which I've just told you which was the right idea and that's how the process works sometimes Bad ideas are actually helpful because yeah. when you investigate why they seem bad, you see another way. And it's yeah. just, it's just a, as I say, it's just, you know, you're just, you're just turning up cards. And then when nothing turns up, you shuffle the deck again and you turn up more cards. And sooner or later, it seems like more often than not, you come up with the right combination of cards. Yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah. You know, it's not the exalted word of God. It's turning over cards. Yeah. So, so there's a, oh, sorry, it, go ahead, Marty. So I want to, I want to go back a little further um, into your childhood um, to, to know that you wanted to be a movie critic. I mean, you had to have had a lot of movies in your life. So how did you get the exposure? So you were born uh, around what, 1947, 48? 46, 46. 1946. Yeah. Um, and, of course, you know, the 50s and 60s, there's some, some great movies that, that came out during that, that era. What were the, I guess, the movies that really influenced you that, that you know, you, that's what I want to do. I want to I watch movies. I want to write about movies, criticize movies. I want to write my own books. And, of course, I mean, that's the tail end of World War II also. So you grew up in that era post uh, World War II. Talk about that also. Well, indeed, it was, and in the fifties, World War II was everywhere. It totally saturated the culture. Uh, Eighty percent of the movies were about World War II. Seventy percent of the books were about World War II. World War II, and of course, we didn't call it World War II. It was just called the war, yeah. and. Uh, uh, it was enormously influential uh, on my, uh, as I developed, you know, between the ages of, I entered the 50s at four and <laughs> left at 14. And those are the most vulnerable years intellectually and because you don't have any defenses. You don't know any better. And that stuff just goes straight into your mind and stays there forever. And I grew up in a town called Evanston, and within walking distance, there were two movie theaters. One was called the Varsity, and one was called the Valencia. And there was actually a third movie theater a little bit further away called the Coronet. And the three of them represented the three main streams in cinema of the 50s, the Varsity was the high tone pictures it was the MGM pictures it was the musicals it was the big expensive pictures it was the movies with the classy stars the varsity was the B picture house and that was you got a new double feature every week that's where the monster movies played that's where the horror movies played that's where most of the war movies played and the coronet which i didn't get until later was the art house and that's where the foreign movies play and i actually my father uh, also seemed to like movies 
he took me at a very young age to see The Magician, which was one of the first Ingmar Bergman films that was uh, um, uh, brought to America. And this was in the mid-50s, and I must have been, you know, 10 or 12 years old. And I remember I understood that it was different, and I understood that it was very good. And I understood that there was this whole other movie world out there that needed to be explored and, and, and not ever understood completely, but you had to experience. But at the same time, my favorite movie re remained, remained uh, the Valencia. And I, you know, I went to the Valencia every weekend just walked down there with friends for uh, it was in downtown Evanston and saw all the Jeff Chandler war movies and the Rory Calhoun Westerns and the, uh, <laughs> and the, and the Japanese, I, you know, I remember Godzilla. I remember the beast of 20,000 uh. pounds. The first movie I ever saw by myself, that is, with other kids as opposed to being taken to by my children was the beast from 20,000 fathoms. And actually, you know, I still, every time it's on, uh, uh, TCM, I, I give it a watch. It stands up pretty well. I mean, I'm, I must say they did a pretty good job. And, um, and I think about it now, this is the first time it's secured to me, but the beast from 20,000, Fathoms was really my imagination mm -hmm. and it was blown out of the ice cap by that movie and set <laughs> the walk. And all these years later, it's still clomping around. So, uh, you know, in that, in, in terms of movies, as you say, the movies of the fifties through the sixties and the seventies, those were you know, those were great years for movies. Yeah. Those movies were about something. They were historical or they were tight. You know, they just, the one thing I missed and didn't get around to until later was film noir. I had no idea what film noir was. And in fact, as an early on in my movie career, movie uh, critic career, I... I knew there was something there, but I didn't know it had a formal name. And I remember writing a very early piece and referring to the movie as a wet street movie. Wet and I didn't know there was a formal term, film noir, but I knew there was a look and a style and a set of ideals, <laughs> ideas and a set of actors and actresses that filled this world. I just didn't know what it was called. And so I invented a name for it. And, you know, eventually, duh, I learned, you know, because I, I, I did a lot of learning on that job. Uh, and so, so, and then the other thing, I, am I talking too much? Or to keep no, this is great. great. This, this is awesome. No, no. Oh, okay. keep going. The next thing I discovered or simultaneously was the newspaper. And there were four newspapers in Chicago at the time. We got the Sun-Times in the morning and the Daily News in the evening. And uh, I love the Daily News. It had a big sheet of pictures on its last page. It had, and it was through the Daily News that I learned what film criticism was. Guy's name was Sam Lesnar. I... I just would always look for Sam's pieces. He would write about the new movies and tell us what was good and what was bad about them. And suddenly it occurred to me that here was a guy who made his living and got some measure of community respect <laughs> and attention by writing about movies. And that was much more, I mean, I understood that making movies was a whole different ball game that that would involve career planning and managing and uh, ass kissing and <laughs> negotiating a very tough industry. And I, I just knew that 
that probably wasn't my talent set. But writing about movies was something I could do. And so at an early age, I was I was reading uh, first Sam Lesnar. I was there in college when Roger Ebert came along. Uh, and I was discovering film criticism and that, you know, so I wanted to do, I wanted to tell the kind of movies, stories that the varsity had told me as a consumer of narrative. And I wanted to write the kind of pieces that Sam Lesnar wrote as, and I read as a consumer of journalism. And those goals were set and as I say, I somehow managed to bring them both off by the time I was 35. And I don't know how I did it. I don't know what luck was involved. I do know that there were things that had nothing to do with me that were really important in that development. Yeah. There were uh, things that stood in the way that, miraculously when i was ready disappeared give an example uh, of one of those about the internal culture of two newspapers and when i was ready to be a film critic there was no way of being a film critic on the sun because the sun was run by old ivy league guys who all knew each other and they were not about to let some clown from the midwest who wasn't even in the real newspaper, but was in the Sunday features department, they were not allowed to let him have a key job on the paper. And they didn't, you know, it had nothing to do with talent. It had to do with pedigree. But just when that frustrated me the most, there was an internal revolution and that whole apparatus was washed away. And suddenly from finding me an annoyance, the new people found me the solution to all their problems. And so I went literally from a non-starter to a, the ace of the staff in about six months. Wow. Uh, it was incredible. <laughs> and it had really little to do with me. It had to do with other internal forces on the newspaper that had been building up that were demanding change, that wanted the paper, to get the paper out of the 30s, which is when it had been great, and get it into the, you know, into the 70s or the 80s and try and make it great again. And I, you know, there's, as I say, nothing to do with me. I was just there then when. And so I became a movie critic. Epitome of right place, Bro. right time, huh? Exactly. Yeah, you know, uh, it, yeah, you, you've you made all these comments about not knowing what you're doing. And all all the while, I've been writing down things from business and self-help books that I've read over the years that you're nailing. And the first one, the easiest there is, uh, uh, there's a book called, um, oh gosh, Good to Great. And one of the, that's about com successful companies that beat all the odds. You know, it, it, he, this guy did a this academic did a very interesting job of, of um, yeah, this guy did a very interesting job of charting um, the, the success of companies. And one common feature of all the CEOs was that they were soft spoken and talked extensively about all the luck that they had had. And I'm reminded of the expression, luck is the residue of preparation. And uh, that goes down to one of Stephen Covey's uh, seven habits of highly effective people is to start with the end in mind. And at 14, you knew where you wanted to be. And then you, you every day you move towards that. Now, maybe some days you took two steps back and one step forward. But, you know, you always wanted to do this and you went out and did it. And then the other ones you talked about um, doing both movie criticism and novels, which are sort of diametrically opposed in some sense. And um, uh, there's a guy named uh, Tim, oh gosh, I'm going to, Tim Ferriss, who wrote a book called The 4-Hour Workweek, and he prescribes the method that you were using. And um, he talks about Parkinson's law, which is that a, ta a task expands to meet the time allotted for it. And um, that, that's the novel problem, right? There's no end date. 
you know, there's there's artificial end dates, but, you know, I've heard all the time of these novels stretching out years and years. And then you've got Pareto's law that's the 80-20 rule, right? That you're going to get 80% of the benefit and 20% of the time. And so you made, you had this practical scissor in your life between Parkinson's law and Pareto's law that are synergistic in fantastic ways. And it's just, yes, maybe it was luck that that you ended up with those two dual roles, but holy heck, what a, what a stack of, of, uh, for those out there listening and wanting to build a career, you could do a lot worse than incorporate those four things. Remember that you need luck, start with the end in mind and then Parkinson's and Pareto's law. So I'm, I'm, have you heard I'm of any of that, or... Stephen? <laughs> have you heard yeah. any of that stuff? Do what? I said, have you heard of any of that stuff? Uh, those people that Brian have talked about there? Uh, I don't read them, but I do recognize some of their principles, and uh, as they as they filter toward me, or as they as they drift towards me, and what what Brian just said, I found very 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 interesting, and I actually agree with it that there are principles that some people just know. And, and, and some people don't. And I'll give you another one. It's very similar to those. And ironically, I, I, I read a piece on how to do science. And it was by, I don't know, some very well-known, maybe Charles, the, the sort of radical. Fauci? Charles, <laughs> he, he's, uh, he's Hungarian, Charles Fentanyl or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, he wrote a very short essay on how to do science, and it was extremely useful, but it was also how to write a novel. And mm-hmm. in retrospect, it's how to do any big daunting task. And it begins with two words. I used to do a lecture on uh, which was called, I would teach you how to write a novel in five words. No, in six words. And the first two words were start now. <laughs> I run into people all the time who are on the verge of starting their novels. Somehow they never do. That They don't. But you have to start now. They can always find an excuse one of the most common is they've got to do the research. Well, not really. You can do the research as you write the book. And it's actually more efficient that way because then you know exactly what you need as opposed to, you know, when I I've done, I've just finished a book on, on uh, set in World War II, it's set in Normandy, in 1944, in what was called the Bocage, which was where the U.S. troops got hung up by German snipers. And it's so I bought 10 books on the Battle of Normandy. Did I read all 10 books on the Battle of Normandy? No. I went to the index of each book and I looked <laughs> up the word Bocage. And I read 10 two-page sections on the Battle of the Bocage. And that was enough research. I didn't, I didn't get, I didn't have to have a big picture. And maybe I lose some things by not getting the big picture, but I don't stop writing. I don't lose the book. You, you, what people do is they lose contact with the book and you've got to keep going. You've got to maintain con- connection with the book. The second three words, this will be five. And then there's a six. The second three words are work every day. And that's what I, I just said, because you, it's so much harder to start back up than it is to go upstairs for 30 minutes and work. Just do it every day and make it, don't make it drama. Don't make it angst. Don't make it 
anything, you know, explosively uh, operatic, make it habit. It's like brushing your teeth. You wouldn't dream of spending a day without brushing your teeth. Okay, so build it into your life that you wouldn't dream of spending a day without working on your book. Make a, make a point that you only don't work on your book if it's physically impossible. Like you have a flat tire, you spend seven hours in a gas station waiting for the new tire to be brought in, you get home at four in the morning, dead tired. That's an excuse for not working on the book. But don't not work on the book because, you know, I worked real hard yesterday. I need a break. That's the way to death. That's the real, the true yeah. road to oblivion. Okay, one more word. Maybe the most important. The last word is finish. I don't know <laughs> why people can't finish. I, I don't know if it's a talent or if it's a freak of personality or what it is, but so many really talented people just can't finish the damn things. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe 10 times more talented than I am. They just don't. And I, one of my Steve-isms is the <laughs> most important words you write in a book are the and end. The joke is, you don't write them. I, I've never written them. Nobody writes them. You just stop typing. But the point is, it's nothing unless it's finished. And particularly if you're trying to get into the business, trying to get into the business, and they say, what have you got? You say, well, I've got a, a third of a novel. Uh, I mean to go back to it. Uh, uh, and he will say to you, well, when you finish it, give me a call. And he knows you'll never finish it. And maybe, as you talked about, preparation, luck is the, is the residue of preparation. Was that the line? Yes, yes. Okay, turning point in my life, as I say, this woman comes to Baltimore. Uh, we hit it off. She's an editor. Uh, three days later, or three weeks later, she writes me a letter. She says to me, you know, I've been with a lot of writers and a lot of editors in my life, and you strike me as having a writer's personality, not an editor's personality. So let me ask you, do you write? Do you have something you can show me? Okay. Thank God. I had something I could show her. It yeah. was a book I had finished. Okay. There it was, 340 pages. Was it publishable? Not really. Was it promising? Very. But when I sent it to her, it said to her, whatever this guy has or doesn't have, he's going to finish the damn thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's take a crack at him. And that's, Again, that's as much as anything why the whole thing uh, started rolling. And that is, it's luck, but it's also, if I may say so, it's also pluck. You've got to do <laughs> the work. You don't do the work. Goodbye. You lose. You don't exist. Nobody will remember. You have to do the work. Yeah, definitely. So taking those six well, words that you just told us, start now, work every day, finish. Apply those to uh, your 20-plus novels that you've written over the years. Which one was the hardest one to start? Well, I've had books that I've lost faith in. Uh, or I've had books uh, I've had books where I was halfway through and I thought of another book that I liked much better. And I wanted to give up on the book that I was halfway through, but I didn't. And I, I found that very hard. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just because my, my heart and my mind were elsewhere. But I had, in those cases, fortunately, I had a contractual obligation and I had taken money. 
and I would have to give money back. It's a great motivator, right? <laughs> and I'd also get a reputation as trouble. Yeah. And, you know, it's a, it's a small industry. People talk. There are reputations. And for me, at least, believing myself not to be Dostoevsky or even John Updike, but only Steve Hunter, I knew that I knew that uh, I had to play by the rules, by their rules. And if they said the book was due on December 1st, they had to get the book on December 1st. And I couldn't play tortured genius. I couldn't, I couldn't have emotional, you know, breakdowns mm -hmm. and, and setbacks. Like, you know, I'm fighting with my wife, so I haven't worked for three weeks. You know, that sort of thing. I had to turn in a manuscript on the due date uh, with the, uh, um, with the proviso, uh, you know, that it be a uh, readable copy. It didn't have to be flawless. Uh, they have people whose jobs it is to make it flawless, but it had to be in pretty good shape yeah. and not demand huge reworking. And that's what I consider being a professional. And I've always done this. In fact, this last, this world that I just told you about, I beat the due date by two years. So <laughs> <laughs> Way ahead of the game. Some idea. Now, is that one out yet or is it? To come. No, that one won't be published until next year. Ah, now, right now the book that I'm working on won't be published until ninth. When would that be? Twenty twenty four. So I'm Jeez. ahead of the game, uh, you know. And I, this is because I inserted a book in the process, uh, and it threw the timing all off, and it. It upset the schedule, but in the long haul, it did me more good than bad. And it gave me this sort of, it let me do the book way ahead of schedule yeah. because I, I, it's a long story. It's too tedious to tell, but I published a book called uh, Basil's War, which was based on a book I'd previously written called Citadel and turning Citadel into Basil's War only took a month. So I managed to get a full book out of a month's worth of work as opposed to the usual 16 months of work or mm -hmm. 14 months of work. So I, you know, I'm 13 months ahead of the game right now, which is where I am for time whatever. Is, time is on your side. Time is on your side to turn another one of your Bob Lee Swagger books into a movie. Good question, and the answer <laughs> is out there. I told you, Wait a I minute. felt myself. Say it again. It, you broke up. We lost you at. My answer is, they, we got to. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Right now, nothing is being is is being is in development. There are some scripts written. Uh, there are some projects that are barely alive. They're on the most intense kind of artificial respiration. But that is a town in which deals can appear and disappear yeah. in hours. And if something happens, uh, I could go from oblivion to stardom and back to oblivion again in a week. Uh, and there could be uh, movies. Uh, I think they're waiting until I die. You're never going to be in oblivion <laughs> again. You, yeah, you, no, have, I think they're saying, you have marked yeah, your place in history. <laughs> you annoyed us so much as a critic that we're going to wait <laughs> until you are dead, D-E-A-D, -E dead, <laughs> until we turn all of your books into uh, movies and make all of your heirs very wealthy. But that's okay, <laughs> you know. I, well, uh, for the... Yeah. For the listeners out there, uh, Shooter is one of my favorite action movies, and it is not a pimple on the ass of the book. So for you folks that are wondering if it's worth reading Point of Impact and the other books, uh, the answer is a profound yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's they're They're very good. Would you mind talking a little bit about 
what you like best in shooting. It seems like you've got a, a great deal of understanding and knowledge when it comes to bench guns and bolt guns and precision shooting. Is Has that been most of your, your shooting career, recreational uh, as it is? No. Uh, in fact, uh, as opposed to my riding career, my shooting career is a loser's career. And by that, I mean I start and I stop. I flit from discipline to discipline. I enter a certain house of guns and I spend a year or two there. And then one day it's not interesting to me and I move on to another house of guns. And one consequence of that is I have become pretty good. I probably made, had I started earlier, I probably would have made a pretty good three gun shooter. Uh, but I am not, profoundly uh, uh, effective in any one particular discipline, although I do a lot of things a lot better than average. And I, you know, I will go through stages. For example, the last year or two, well, I, I went through a profound marksmanship stage. I bought a lot of 22 target pistols, even several 22 short target pistols. And I'm talking some European guns, uh, uh, you know, not, I'm not talking Rugers. Uh, I do have one Smith 41. I do have, um, uh, you know, I've got, a, I've got a Hammerly, a gun I like very much is a French gun. Uh, God, what is it called? Looks like a Buck Rogers ray gun. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, looks very Art Deco, as a matter of fact. Uh, very 30s, and it's a very accurate uh, pistol. And I have one in 22. I have one in 32. I'm sorry, in one in 22 short. And I used, for a couple of years, I shot nothing but those working on accuracy. And mainly I worked on trigger pull. And mm -hmm. you know, just this little finger here. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. It's just amazing what discipline and refinement is necessary to uh, make it work effectively. And how, you know, there's some people with more gifts than others, uh, but never, whoever becomes a good shooter it starts with having an educated trigger finger and a trigger finger that can do consistently um and doesn't get that fifth shot flyer and uh, you know i'm the best shooter in the world for four shots <laughs> <laughs> and then a lot of times not five uh, hello Anne Arundel County, where the hell? Go? And that's 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 my bane. Although I've gotten better over the years, and in fact, I will tell you that when you let me go, nap, and then I'm going to go to the shooter's range, shooting range, and uh, I've already got my guns laid out. I'm going to shoot a Kimber 45 Gold Cup. It's an old gun, but it's very accurate. And then I'm going to shoot some Syntec Federal uh, competition ammunition in a uh, SIG three, P320. Uh, I'm very high on the 320. I've, I think I've got four of them now, and I, I find them to be excellent, excellent guns. Sure. That was going to be my question is, of, of all the guns that you own, what's your favorite that's a hard question. Well, it's not really. I did many years ago <coughs> put a great deal of money into a Thompson M1A1. Oh, nice. I went through the whole class three dance. Uh, I love that gun, but I would love it just as much as if I didn't own it. I find for some reason I find shooting it not as much fun as I thought I would have. And mainly because it, the gun is so expensive that shooting it feels like standing on a, on a uh, shooting range and ripping up $50 bills. You know, <laughs> it just, 
it just <laughs> you go through yeah. so much ammunition so quickly, and you look at all that brass, and you think, yeah, yeah, it was great, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's been a while since I shot that gun. Uh, that would have to be I for some reason the M1A1, its lines are enormously attractive to me another gun that i find enormously attractive is the uh pre-64 model 60 uh, 70 winchester i just uh just that's such a beautiful rifle was there a movie that 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 maybe was there a movie that you saw that in that that really uh i I wish there was a great model 70 movie the only one i can think of is i think clark uh, Gable carries one in a 50s Africa movie called Mojumbo or something like that, or <laughs> Jobo or uh, Mom, Mom Yobo or something like that. And not much is made of it. I, I keep waiting for a great Model 70 movie to come along. I think in Point Blank, I think the assassin with the rifle you don't really get a good look at it. Uh, you know, he's the guy who is on the L.A., on an L.A. bridge, and he, he shoots the guy who's supposed to be Lee Marvin, but he shoots him down in the basin, uh, in the in the sewer, or in the, in the I guess it's wrong, it's not a sewer, it's a water release channel uh, that's empty. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, th- I know he's got a urinal scope on it, but I think that he's, uh, I think it's a Model 70, but I, I may be wrong. I- I'll have to look it up. There's a website. Uh, IMFDB. I- yes, I- I- I'll check it up there, and we'll see if I'm pulling if it that, up right now. A Model 70. What was the name, Point Blank? Yeah, Point Blank with Lee Marvin, directed by... Uh, oh God, I can't remember. Yeah, I, I remember. I, I know the director. 1967. Other Who? It's 1967. Crime thriller. Uh, Lee Marvin as Walker, a thief who finds himself betrayed and left for dead by his partner in crime and his wife after a successful heist. That's uh, it. Okay. Um, yeah, written by Donald by, Westlake. Who, who's the? That was the original book. But who's the director? Uh, let's see. The director. Several sort of adaptation during the film is loosely inspired by the 1997. No. That's not telling me here on uh, IMDb. F, IMFDB. Here, let me uh, share my screen. That way you can see it. That might ring a bell or two. Mm. Well, they're the guns he uses. I don't see a Model 70. I, I Walter PPK. Here we go. Oh, oh there we there go. It is. Is. And it's, is that a Model 70? Winchester Model 70. Um, there is the Unertal scope. With a shortened barrel. Is a Model 70 with a shortened barrel? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, <laughs> Guys, it's that time of year. That's cool. Yeah. So there's a Model 70 movie. Uh, yeah. and as I say, Mogambo with Clark, I think Clark, Clark Gable. I, I can't offhand. If we ever do a Carlos Halfcock movie, because Carlos used to model 70, uh, in, uh, far off, uh, Vietnam 50 years ago. With the new Nerdle scope, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. That's yeah. That's yeah. Correct. So the yeah, now so you they, have one of those, right? You said you have a Model seventy. I do, yeah. Nice. Yeah, and in fact, right now I have a thirty out six, which is being rebarreled. It's a very easy rebarreling, rechambering. You don't have to rechamber. Well, you do have to rechamber, but you you can use the same bolt face. Is a uh, guys, it's that time of year again. With five by fifty five Swede, which has become my favorite rifle caliber. I mean, it's it's the proto 260 and the proto 65 Creed, but it's a it's just a great cal low recoiling. It's very it's very uh, 
extremely good uh, uh, wind resistance, high velocity, and extremely accurate. And I own now a whole variety of 6.5 by 55s. And I hope next spring and summer just to spend, you know, every day at the rifle range. It's too cold for me now, but just shooting little holes in little black pieces of paper 200 yards away. And that, that I mean, that to me. That's, what? that's like my therapy. That, that's the that most therapeutic thing I can do. Yeah. Home. That's okay. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> So it looks like that Model 70 was using a bunch of movies. Mad Max, uh, Dirty Harry. Oh, yeah, okay, and Dirty Harry. Harry, uh, well, maybe the rifle that uh, Scorpio uses is a Model 70, but then Harry gets a Model 70 in 458 yeah. Winchester. And I, I'm not sure what rifle scorpio uses yeah 458 magnum is what uh dirty harry uses <laughs> harry uses what else has it been in it has been in uh walking tall um, I, I, billy yeah, jack uh, you remember billy it's jack? never been I may have, see it's in a lot of these movies but it's rarely featured in the way i think of the 44 magnum in the dirty harry movies yeah that's what sure they were it was the feature the star you know that was a character but i can't recall a movie in which a model 70 pre-64 was featured it may have been incidentally carried or used maybe i'm wrong maybe my i have a hole in my movie memory yeah well of course this uh imfdb like even if it just made an appearance they'll have it on here so that's, <laughs> that's kind of cool point break there was one in point break uh, yeah the Australian police officer had one. So, I got a so question are, for you. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Marty. Now, I was oh. I was going to ask, um, in in your years of critiquing uh, movies, I guess what was the your favorite movie to have critiqued, or maybe your fa your favorite critique of a movie? Well, see, when a movie critic thinks about pieces he's written he thinks about his best piece whether or not the movie was any good and so i will remember the pieces better uh than and when i when i it, it's so odd because i still get people who say you know i remember that piece you wrote on x that was fabulous blah 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 blah, blah. sometimes it's a movie i can't even remember or a piece I can remember, but the one piece that I, I thought I, uh, I thought. I mean, I, I will admit also that there were movies that I was good at, and movies I wasn't good at, uh, and there were movies in which I had passions involved, engaged, and there were movies in which uh, I just, I, you know, was faking it. I think that's true of all critics. And uh, I will cite two movies that I felt that I really got better than any of the other boys and girls in my business. Yeah. One was Saving Private Ryan, and the other was uh, uh, Water, uh, not Watership Down, Black Hawk Down. Black Hawk Down, yeah. I wrote two, I felt, quite outstanding pieces on, on those two movies. And... To be honest with you, if I couldn't have written outstanding pieces on those movies, I should have been fired because that that's, you know, that's what that was my strength. And if I'm not doing well at my it's like if the quarterback can't hit the deep ball, what good is he? You know, what's the point? <laughs> I mean, that's in your wheelhouse, right? That that movie's in your wheelhouse. Definitely. Those are my deep balls. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I did read your um your write up on Black Hawk Down, and I'm on the website Pulitzer.org, and they have a list of all the works I guess that were uh, that went into you winning uh, the Pulitzer Prize. Um, and you guys can go there. Uh, those watching on the video, I've got it pulled up right here. Uh, Lord of the Rings. What um, 
What stands out about that movie for you, the J.R.R. Tolkien? Long Hawk Down? Oh, well, I mean, I have to really like Ridley Scott, and I thought he captured, you know, with a few simplifications, a few dramatic licenses. For example, the climax of that movie is when the little bird strafes the... Uh, uh, the little bird being the small gunship helicopter. Yeah. When it strafes the down. building. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, it strafes the buildings only once. And that's the climax of the movie. Well, in reality, the little bird strafed all night. They didn't just, you know, have one run. They yeah. had 50 runs. That was their job. And um, But whereas one little bird run is dramatic <laughs> you know when we're on the third hour of little bird runs it's going to be a little boring so he makes a concession to dramatic structure there and that it seems to me is okay and i thought that that and I, I remember watching it with my wife and she kept saying it's such a mess and i took that as a that was the director really capturing what the author caught in the way that thing fell apart and the way those guys, so many of those guys ended up on their own in this extremely dangerous city being hunted by mobs. And it was a sense of sort of dread and fear and <laughs> And the sound policy of full automatic weapons and lots of ammunition that uh, I, I don't think I've seen anything more, uh, more, uh, you know, more visceral, yeah. more, more uh, demanding, more, uh, uh, more uh, uh, that felt realistic to me, even if, as they say, some of the stuff was you know, truncated or, uh, you know, you know, if some of the stuff was, was, was cut for dramatic purposes. Yeah. It was, it's like you said, it was a very immersive movie. It did, it did bring you into the movie and make you feel that you were in that chaos and that, you know, that battle. Now I had a very profound uh, reaction to, Oh, uh, uh, Private Ryan, because I felt mm -hmm. that it it was the first movie really to I felt show battle the gore, the the physical violence, the violence to the body that that combat necessarily uh, ensues. And I I sort of in a sense I got it, and that Spielberg and I are just about the same age. And we grew up on our bellies in our family's recreation rooms watching World War II movies of the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And while there were many brilliant ones, we also knew that they were, there was a phase, phrase then called movie phony. And we knew that they were movie phony because someone would get shot and you'd see a little trickle of blood, you know, coming down his chin. And we knew that that wasn't the way it happened. And I think that was part of his thing because he's so cognizant of other movies and of the, of the heritage of movies. And he wanted to do a movie that showed you what William Wellman couldn't show you in Battleground. You know, and he loves that movie. Uh, he loves, uh, he's a much bigger into William Wellman than I am. But in any event, he had this sort of need to tell the story at a level of reality. And that level of reality has become quite common now. But that, the shock of seeing that level of realism uh, was so powerful then mm -hmm. that i i still in, in fact i interviewed stephen ambrose who wrote he wrote that and he wrote band of brothers he was a historian the historian 
And he told me that when he saw that D-Day sequence, he 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 had to leave the theater. Yeah. He, he, or he had to stop the screening. He saw it, and then he went and he said, I'm sorry, I, I can't take any more today. That was just too, too powerful. Because here was a man who'd spent his life understanding war, and yet he knew that at some level he really didn't understand it. And that movie suddenly made him understand it. And it was just too powerful. My grandfather went to to see that and that opening, you know, that opening scene there too, it just it tore him up too and he had to leave. He yeah. couldn't he couldn't watch it there either. You go. Yeah. So let's do this. Let's uh Brian, if you got another question, go ahead. But I want to get to our listener questions. We made a post on social media asking for listeners to uh to now, comment. They, you're gonna read these to me. Yes, sir. Actually, talk to other human beings no i'm going to read these they okay. they made we did a post I'm not, earlier i'm not too good you guys are fine but let's just limit it <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 it's too late to make too many people friends. in this party already right <laughs> you picked the most interesting questions all right um and let me get my thing to work here so Doc Dow sixty four, and and we haven't talked about your military background either, and I want to talk about that. He says, "What was it your military service that made you want to write your military based novels? Old Guard is a pretty profound unit to be a part of." Talk talk um, about that. No, in fact, my military service almost made me not want to write military novels. Oh wow! Uh, I, I I will say that. Uh, I was not a particularly good or gifted soldier, and I got a lot more out of the Army than it got out of me. Uh, <laughs> I was very lucky to end up in the old guard. I have this talent for always ending up in the suburbs, and the old guard was the suburbs of the Vietnam Army. And uh, uh, I, I had a an attraction to, and it was entirely a romantic attraction to the army before I went into the army. Uh, I love heroes. I love, I love war movies. I love war novels. I love the narrative of war. And of course, all of that, all of those things are true, but they're not the army. And the army is a huge bureaucratic entity with its own rules but its own flexibilities and its own idiocies but also its own brilliances and i can't say i hated it i certainly was not abused or misused by it i have no uh regrets like any large organization you're always going to find supervisors who are dumber than you and that's true of of anything. And you either make peace with that or are unhappy. Uh, and uh, I made peace with it. And uh, as I say, I met many outstanding officers in the army. I have no, I have no, uh, you know, I have no, I, I met no villains in the army. Everyone I met was either good or trying to do the best that they could. And um, uh, I think in the long run, it does young men good to be in a large, impersonal, illiberal organization where no one says, you don't feel good today. Okay, take some <laughs> private time. Uh -huh. Find a safe space. And come back, and you'll feel much better tomorrow. You know, <laughs> no sergeant I knew ever spoke like that. You know, <laughs> they were too interested in giving you private space. You know, <laughs> you had a job to do, and you ex they expected you to do it, and uh, they didn't expect it; they demanded it, it. Right? It was yeah, and it was it was it's good at 22 to be forced to do something you don't like and to learn that there is 
stuff that has to be done because it's part of what you're there to do. And your feelings, one way or the other, aren't uh, appropriate, aren't interesting, don't matter. And that that discipline is good. Uh, it's a good character builder, good definitely. It's a good thing to experience. And when you get to be my age, then you can say, you know, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I want to <laughs> take some private time. But, you know, don't do it before age 75. <laughs> Maybe it's changed now. Maybe that's one of the things that's going on that I don't approve of. But I just feel that it's a good uh, it's a good thing to to do. That that it's a, it's good, a good experience answer. to have. It's a good answer. I like that. Brian, did you have anything to go along with the that question? No, I think um, uh, the man himself is 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 answering quite completely. And and uh, yeah, I okay. Next yes, question. I, I I too think that um, safe spaces are doing us a great deal of harm. And while um, I do think that that feelings matter. Yeah, we could deal with. I think, uh, yeah, some some uh, service to the country for all young people uh, by managers that don't often respect their needs for safe space would be a, a real benefit to our society. Yeah, that guy is a hundred percent on that one. Right. Yeah. This That's, guy Brian is smart. By the way, have you noticed that? The, why do you think I have him on? <laughs> oh, well, you know, I wasn't sure at first, but he's done a very good job. Yeah. See, he's the kind of guy, he's in the gun world, right? He does, he builds AK 47s. So many people don't get that you can be smart and work in guns. They just don't get that. Their mind don't, don't, can't grasp that. They think you have to be some sort of Neanderthal. Yeah. Uh, you know, they don't. And, they don't understand. It one, takes math. One of my discoveries has been how many smart people there are, and it's 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 one of the joys or wonders of my life. Yeah. Mm. Well, ne thank you. Next question is bonafide breed. It says, "How were you able to transition from being in the service to being an author? And at any moment in your life, did you think you would end up where you are now?" Uh... Well, the transition, uh, I, I, can't, I can't say the transition would have been rough if I'd had a rough time in the service. But as I said, I was in the suburbs of the service and it was pretty easy on me. I mean, I can't, I, I can't, I can't pretend to any, uh, any trauma or psychological difficulty from that i did have trouble finding a job and i went for seven months without a job and i won't go into detail but i did fail at a couple of jobs finally by uh by just sheer luck divine uh, intervention that by luck being the efficient anyway i did get a very humble job on the baltimore sun as a copy reader. And again, that was kind of where, uh, where quote, it all began, even though it was a job I wasn't very good at. And the only thing I can say in those days, we're talking 1971, nobody got fired. You know, if you were hired and you didn't work out, they just found a place to dump you because the organization's, were so prosperous that they carried Deadwood. And so much uh, of America in those days was just clotted with Deadwood, newspapers particularly. But I was able eventually to go from Deadwood to Star. And that progress was felt very good to me and is very meaningful <laughs> to me. And I still, again, I think back uh, how I did it, and I don't really know how I did it, uh, except that, yeah, well, I do know how I did it. The way I did it was I wrote my way out of the Deadwood to the star. And I'll tell you a very tiny little self-serving story, but 
one of the things I had to do, I had to work on the Sun magazine. And this was not fun work. And you, you, I did photo captions, which I hated. And, but sometimes the artists would, just for visual, uh, visual uh, reasons, he'd include a little block of type and a photo layout. And I got one of these, and I said to the guy I was working for, what do I put in here? And he said, I don't know. John wants a block of type there to set off the balance of the page. So write something about uh, the subject of the topic uh, that the story is about that has some uh, meaning, something, you know, it can be something from the story or something about the story. And it had to be the way we did it was it had to be 32 pikas and 18 lines or something like that. So I did it. And I just made something up, and I didn't think about it. And, <laughs> and the guy who got it didn't say anything about it. The only thing he was concerned was, A, were the words spelled right? And B, more important, did it fit? <laughs> so it got into the magazine under the, under the uh, excuse, it fit. <laughs> <laughs> Glock of print, fit. So um, I'm saying. I'm there on Monday, and on Monday, the new magazine arrived in the newsroom, and all of a sudden, people are uh, gathering around the editor's desk, and he keeps saying, oh, oh, Steve, and oh, yeah, no, it was Steve, and nobody, this little <laughs> block of print, it couldn't have been more than 40 words. They hadn't seen, excuse me, work of that quality in that magazine ever. And it, it made me, in an instant, it, it marked me as someone with talent and someone to be watched. And it took nine years and lots more little blocks of print, but just... <laughs> Being able to do that made uh, just, it was so important to me. It filled me with such confidence and it made me think that maybe I could have a future in this industry. And, you know, it's on little things like that. Keeps the that fire burning, burn. right? Yeah, that the fire is lit or the fire continues to burn. So that was that. Guys, I have to say, you can tell my voice is about ready to burst. We're wrapping floor. it up. We are wrapping it up. Can we can we tighten her down now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're gonna we're gonna wrap it up right now. Um, but I can't let you go without maybe getting your commentary on on today's events um, that are going on because a lot of a lot of novels will imp, you know integrate implement current events and things that are going now. Jay Allen wants to know: Are there any upcoming content? inspired by what's going on in our world today? Uh, I do a book like Targeted. The last book I did like Targeted was called Soft Target. Uh, and it had, it was explicitly about today. And it expressed my anger and dismay through fiction in symbolic terms. And that is exactly what I do or what I have done in targeted and anyone with half a brain will understand that. Uh, but if you don't get that, that's okay too. I mean, first of all, it is a story. Okay. So I want you to enjoy it. It was constructed as I want you to destroy it as a story. Well, it was constructed as a satire. I think it's really funny. Yeah. I think my portrait of two politicians are really funny spot on and too. <laughs> third of all it i don't know if it's in service to an agenda but it is in service to certain values that i do not want to see forgotten now those values will all underlie my books say coming out next year and it has no uh, because it's World War II, set in July 
of 1944, it, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with today's America, but its values are the values of World War II, the values of this and commitment, belief in nation and culture and belief in good over evil. And those values always be in my work. I'm not, you know, those are my values. We don't like it. Don't buy it. But, <laughs> don't read it. but I feel the dog to change. Very good. Awesome interview. Thank you, Stevens, for taking the time oh, to be on. I could talk too much. No, oh, this was great. Both you guys. We, this was great, oh, and I appreciate you, you spending this much time with us. Um, glad the pipes held out. It was a good exercise for your pipes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'm excited that you're going to the range, but I'm bummed because I'm not uh, going to get to go with you. Uh, and I understand that you're going to be at SHOT Show as well this year. Uh, I'm not going to SHOT Show. Did you think I was going? I have. I misunderstood then. David said you were going to, uh, to SHOT Show. I, I, had, I had asked to go. Uh, I've, but I, in the end, uh, it didn't, it didn't work out. I yeah. can, I'm not too anxious at my age and vulnerability, uh, with the COVID back in a most yeah. uh, heavy way. I'm not too anxious. It's here I'm with you. Yeah. and, uh, the liquor store <laughs> and the firing range. Those are, those are my three destinations. Well done, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. I, I love your priorities. Those are awesome. Those are mine as well. And I'm not going to go, I'm not going to SHOT Show either. This will be the first time in like, 10 years uh, that I haven't gone, other than when they canceled it. Uh, Brian, I don't think you're going to go either, right? I'm going to Vegas because I got to do business meetings, but I don't think I'm actually going to go in the show itself. Shot show crud happens every year where people get gnarly, gnarly flus, and we we've had the corona anyway. going every year. It's just called the shot yeah. show crud, is what it's yeah, called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been been exposed and immune to it already several times, but uh, not to fear, leadheads. We will get coverage of the shot show. So anything new and exciting going on there, we will be talking about it here on the show. We just won't be there in person this year to. Uh, to cover it, uh, Bill Doe's going to be there, Bill Hampstead, and anything that we need to know about, he's going to inform us. So we got it covered, definitely. Again, Stephen, thank you so much. Go to go to Amazon.com, go to Simon & Schuster. You can get the new uh, book, the 12th in the Bobbly Swagger series called Targeted. It was a great read. I really enjoyed it. I know you leadheads are going to love it. And Brian has my copy of that book. Uh, I, I mailed my copy to Brian, and we're going to give that that copy away to one of our listeners, Stephen. I don't know. Oh, if that's great. Um, so, one of the one of the questions that I asked today: Are you on Instagram, Brian? Uh, yes, sir. Pick one of those people who posted a question. Pick your favorite question there. Stephen's not on social media, so he can't pick the winner. Um. And you can't pick Jack Carr. Don't pick Jack. <laughs> Let's go with uh, Bonafide Breed. Bonafide um, Breed. Yeah. Okay. And he asked the he asked a couple of questions, I think, actually. Yeah, the one I'm looking at is how were you able to transition from being in the service to being an author? And, yeah. that, and at any moment in your life, did yeah. you think you would end up where you are now? I, I think that's a good general, really nice question. And we've gotten some, there some you great go. answers from Mr. Hunter here. So Bonafide Breed. Uh, you get the my copy of Targeted by Stephen Hunter that Brian has. So when he gets finished with it, he's going to send it to you. So shoot me an email, talkinglet at gmail.com, and uh, Brian may even sign it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll sign it, Stephen Hunter. <laughs> yeah, <there> we <laughs> Which would be awesome. Um, but yeah. until then, as always, Leadheads, make sure you go and support those that make this show possible. Caltech Weapons, Mission First Tactical, Seal One, Nemo Arms, Factory 47, 1776 United, Occam Defense Solutions, coming back for Season 4 of the AK Corner, IWIUS, yeah. and we've got a new sponsor for the AK, or AK Corner this season, and you'll find out just shortly, because Brian and I are going to record 
episode one this week to be released next week. So that's coming up. And Stephen, you're more than welcome to join us on that AK Corner season kickoff. Would love to have you on. We're just going to talk AKs, kind of like we do now. We just sit around, shoot the shit, and have a good time. Well, it sounds good, but um, the, the, the truth is I don't know that much about AKs to keep up with you guys. Oh, I bet you know. No. Uh, you've forgotten more than we know about. Well, I doubt that. But, like, I can't figure out why does the AK-74 – why does it have two different muzzle brakes? Is there some significance that in that? that? It has that one that's sort of bulbous, and then it has one that has big openings in it. And I'm not sure. Is one a later development? One of them, um, if, if you, what I think you mean with the bulbous one is the four-piece Bulgarian, and that's typically found on stuff like the AKSU or Crink. And the purpose yeah. of it is to sustain the pressure that is present at the gas block I to see. give a little bit longer time for the um, for the piston to be actuated for cycling. Okay. When you when you without that thing, you only have a very very small time at which the bullet is past the gas port, but has not yet left the barrel. And we call that dwell time. And the that the booster that Marty shows there is is quite good at at raising the time uh, that dwell time artificially, kind of like a suppressor, but not really a suppressor. I got you. No, I understand. I mean, I do. One of the things I've never really understood about guns is the is the play of pressure, and that's and particularly for any semi-automatic system, people don't understand. Well. They don't understand how those pressures have got to be within certain exact ranges to make yep. the gun work. It's not any cartridge will work. It, you know, it's just not arbitrary. It's very carefully engineered and modulated. Well, I'm a I'm a physicist where most of my career has been in nuclear medicine and stuff like that. And I got into guns fairly late in life and the AK quickly captured my fascination for exactly that reason that it's a little physics lab in a box and oh, yeah. it's simple yeah. enough where you can yeah. really play with complex ideas like the I, one I, that you just very stated point. very interesting mm -hmm. i'm gonna claim that i thought of that do you mind <laughs> please please do yes <laughs> so, Stephen, you've got another resource now uh, for your books if you ever need, uh, you know, to do some research on guns or uh, ballistics or anything like that. Look I, at the, the big brain uh, I, on Brian. I, I, yeah, I, I, I would fall all over myself to help you out on technical okay. stuff for fun. So, uh, yeah, by all means, please look me up. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, Brian, that wraps up another episode of the Talking Lead Podcast. Appreciate you co-hosting with me uh, today and looking forward to our upcoming AK Corner. Oh, it was an honor. Yeah. But until then, Leadheads, as always, keep your loved ones close. And your firearms closer. And go out and get your copy of Targeted by Stephen Hunter.